My name is John Peter Njiru and Bature. Bature is uh, the family name. And so I'm a coffee farmer in Kenya, uh, Embu. So the farm, the farm, the family farm is uh, Kamavindi Coffee. And uh, Kamavindi is 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 um is 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 located at um, at an elevation of around 1,700 meters above sea level, and we are mainly like SL28 variety, SL28 coffee variety. So SL28 is um, is uh, is susceptible to to leaf rust and CBD coffee berry disease, despite the fact that it has like um, very uh, a very good cup quality and also like very good production. The, one of the challenges is of course like the cost of uh, the inputs, the, the, the fungicides that we have to use and then uh, sometimes weather. You no, know, it, 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 it could rain more, like it could rain continuously and you need to spray the coffee, like uh, apply the fungicides and you can't do that when it's raining. So the weather is also like a challenge. And then labor, you know, you need to have the right people at, at the right time. So you need to have someone who's trained to do that. So that's the cost of labor and the availability of labor is also a challenge. What are some of the challenges that you face with um with making sure you're getting the best price for your coffee? Um, I'd say transparency, because sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes, so here's here's the, the picture. So not many Kenyan farmers can cup their own coffee. So when I, when I started like getting serious into coffee, the first thing I did was to learn how to test the coffee and analyze the coffee and so that no, you can talk about your coffee. You can, you know what you're doing, what you're producing. But then, most of most of the farmers we have in Kenya can't taste their own coffee, and so they end up relying on the marketers to tell them like, this is what your coffee was like. Not every marketer will be will be transparent with, with their coffees, especially now that the farmer doesn't know what quality they are producing. So I'm trying to think about it because you no, know, as Kamavindi, we've we've had like good seasons and we've not like had lots of challenges because first we have a partner who buys our coffee, like Counterculture Coffee buys all our volume, and so you know we discuss the prices with the buyer, but not every farmer in Kenya has that opportunity to like discuss the prices with. The, the buyer, the person who ends up buying the coffee. So, you know, definitely we'd, we'd have issues with transparency. And I'll say that maybe in my opinion, transparency would might, could be the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest challenge when it comes to getting like a good price for. You know, every coffee variety needs to be handled differently, even at the farm level. So when it comes to processing, uh, I wouldn't expect us to process the Ruru 11 in the same way we're going to process the SA28 and just get a good car from the Ruru 11. So we need to come up with ways specific to every variety because they are different. So uh, from, from the variety separation that I've been doing, I end up processing the Ruru 11 and handling it different, differently uh, from how I will handle. And that gives the Ruru 11 like a perfect cup. Sometimes, you know, you, you yeah, w- w- now being like, uh, when you're more experienced with the varieties when in the cup and cupping the different varieties, you, you can tell the difference between the two. But for just a coffee lover, I've seen people like even choosing the the Rio 11 over the SL28 based on how the the coffee was processed. Yeah, the future I believe is we. I, I think we have a, a big future for the Kenyan coffee industry, and 
like uh, the, the world prices, the, the world market, the prices are also up. And I see the possibility of those prices maintaining in the, for the next two years being like quite favorable. And so, yeah, there's lots of motivation for youths in Kenya to get back into coffee. So I believe the future is, is, is bright. It's going to, we're going to have more, more and more, more volume from Kenya soon. Hi, I'm Didi, and I've worked in coffee for over a decade. I love coffee, and as much as I've learned about coffee in that time, my desire to learn more has only grown. Coffee is a daily, simple pleasure to us, and I love that. But it's also fun to explore the complexities, not only in flavor, but where it comes from, how it's made, and what it says about us. There's still so much to discover. In this show, I'm talking with coffee people in and around my hometown of Atlanta to seek deeper insights, explore the future of the beverage, and find out what makes us tick. This week, we're talking with coffee farmer John Peter Njudo Mbature and sustainability expert Kim Alana Ionescu about the future of coffee farming. Our relationship with coffee is going to change drastically in the coming decades. Issues such as climate change and labor shortages threaten the future of accessibility to coffee as we know it. As the sustainability officer at the Specialty Coffee Association, Kim shares her vast knowledge to help us understand the complexity of these issues. It's her knowledge and understanding mixed with her resounding positivity that really gives me hope for the future of coffee. Uh, what is your role at the SCA? So I am the Chief Sustainability Officer. It's my job to think about the issues that are affecting coffee in potentially keeping it from being viable and to bring the members of our association and then also of the coffee industry more broadly together to work on those issues in ways that they as individuals couldn't alone. So with something like climate change, you know, what's there are things that individual companies can do and individual farms, but there are also many things that are beyond the scope of even the largest coffee you know, industry participants. Um, so how can we use our common interests and work together on those? And that's where an association comes in. What are some of the elements that make coffee vulnerable um, in its existence? Oh gosh. Um, well, uh, so there's, you know, there's the fact that it grows in specific climates. You know, I think about the fact that it's grown in 70-ish, 60-something countries and like, wow, it's so, you know, it, it's, it's so adaptable. It grows in all these places, except all of those places have these, you know, these conditions in common and coffee is not, um, the most, the hardiest plant. So it can't survive a freeze you know it can barely survive a, a frost in many places so that kind of limits how far north or south it can grow it grows better and tastes better at elevation and you know as a specialty coffee um person then taste is a huge part of why i mean even you know the lousiest of coffee taste is still a big reason that we drink coffee it's all you know it, it's all about uh drinking it as opposed to like using it for construction or something it's yeah, like yeah it's very um, sensory yeah and even people who drink coffee that's not objectively that good still love it like we feel we feel this way about coffee but um so it doesn't grow in that many places and a lot of those places where it does grow are the ones that are the most vulnerable or being the most impacted by um climate change and uh climate variability and severe weather events and then there's the fact that coffee is uh doesn't have all that much genetic diversity to draw from so because of its history and who planted it and that the process of transporting it from one place to another we've ended up with a really limited gene pool which means that one disease can wipe out like an entire region's worth of coffee production in a year and that's um 
you know, that, that spells disaster for any plant. And then, you know, on top of those sort of environmental and, and physiological uh, characteristics of of coffee. There's also the um, the way that it was planted and who grows it now. And uh, for so long during its history, coffee was planted by and, and sort of farmed. The farms were owned by people in positions of relative privilege, and those farms were worked by people in positions of relative vulnerability. And, and some of that's changed, but some of that persists. And um, and as younger generations now have of farmers and farm workers have access to technology and and see that their future isn't you know they have choices and they could leave coffee some of them are choosing to do that because it's not it's not demonstrating that this is a really viable way to um to make a living so all of those things contribute to the vulnerability of coffee i'd say sounds like you're you're sensitive to this issue of um of people leaving the farm or you know what's going to happen uh with this new like young generation coming up. Um, however, your position as a sustainability officer, correct me if I'm wrong, but it it sounds like you are um, the one who people are looking for, uh, lo looking towards to for solutions. Um, is that the case? Are you the solution finder? Yeah, kind of. I mean, it's like the, that. yeah. Uh, I think that everyone would like there to be a simple solution, first of all, that wants the solutions to be simple and, um, and doesn't want to have to change too much, you know? So like, we need a solution, we need answers. And then when it comes up that, well, you know, we need to make coffee farming more attractive if we want young people to do it because two generations ago, they didn't have access to technology. They didn't have the same sort of um, ability to go, some of the same jobs didn't exist. There's been a lot of economic development in some of these coffee producing regions. Um, more options are available. So we need to think about that. How do we make coffee farming more attractive? And I think that's a good question that points at solutions, but those aren't easy solutions, you know? Like there are a lot of things that uh, that young people may want that they don't have or, or trying to actually do the work to make coffee more attractive is, um, that's a long-term proposition. I, I hear you and I, I'm really curious, um, you've asked people what they need. Mm -hmm. what, what do young farmers want and need? Uh, one thing that, you know, I was surprised and I shouldn't be as like a, a cusp of millennial person, but when younger farmers and farm workers were asked what they value um, and how they choose where they want to work, one of the things that came up as a high priority was um, cell phone service. And, you know, again, I shouldn't be surprised at that as someone who's attached to their phone all the time. But I was because I didn't think about that. I was sort of putting on a different lens and thinking, well, okay, if I imagine myself as a farmer, as opposed to like, if I were, if I were actually in that particular situation. Um, so I think that that reminder that uh, sometimes, I don't know, sometimes it's a, we can be surprised and surprised by maybe how similar um, the desires of farmers are to what the desires of, of buyers are um, is a good is a good lesson. Yeah, um, I mean, I think about what my my needs are. Um, I'd, I'd like to make a living wage. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to be able to take care of my health, um, have transportation in some form. Um, do you feel like um, the the needs that these young farmers have are possible? to acquire or reach. Yeah, and you know, and I think that one of the things that you didn't mention there that I would wager is part of your hierarchy of, of needs or the things that you want is some sort of fulfillment out of your job and to feel recognized, to feel like you're doing a good job. And that's something that also comes out every time you, know, you actually ask people what they want and you spend time doing it is that, yeah, there is this desire for, you know, transportation and job security. Um, that's another thing about coffee employment is that sometimes it's not even the, the wages or the, the price of the coffee that's the problem, or it, is, it can be a problem, but a greater problem is the fact that it's seasonal. So what do you do the rest of the year if you're a coffee farmer depending exclusively on coffee or a picker who's trying to make a living from coffee picking? That's not enough employment. It doesn't, you know, you can't stretch it uh, to meet your 
year's worth of needs. Um, but many, anyway, but many of them will say that, uh, that what they also want is that recognition that what they're doing is, is that they're doing a good job and that what they're doing is meaningful. And so that brings me to these relationships again and the utility of them to where being able to be recognized by someone, whether that's with your name on a you know package of coffee or whether that's through a certificate, those things in some ways, you know, compared to a living wage, it feels so minor. And there's not an equivalency there. We're comparing, it's like not the same thing, but I think it's, it's sort of both. Like we both need living wages and we also need people to feel individually recognized for doing something that is valued by someone else. Absolutely. Like there's something about the romanticism of the coffee farmer that has been um, discouraged. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we, we can't romanticize them. It, mm -hmm. They are, they're just people and they are just farmers. But I, I'm careful not to completely dismiss that because there is something when I get this bag of coffee that says Jose Martinez on the outside and we all scream out his name when someone orders their coffee because we love this coffee. We don't know what he looks like, mm -hmm. um, but we, you know, we we hope that like our collective voice in that moment in the cafe somehow reaches him, you know, wanting to celebrate him for, you know, creating something that we love so much. Um, but that's just not reality, right? Like how do we like as consumers um, send that appreciation back? Is it just buying the cup of coffee? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's tricky because like you, I've seen the coffee industry, and not just the coffee industry, but in the past 10 or 20 years, I've seen us as, I've seen us culturally romanticize the farmer. And that could be the coffee farmer, and along with the coffee farmer also comes the story of poverty often and you know needing our help. But then I think we also can romanticize the farmer who sells tomatoes at the farmer's market. And to me, that connects to the fact that what we're buying when we buy these coffees and we make this, these decisions, it is, it is like we're buying a better product. The farmer's market tomato tastes better than the tomato at the grocery store in December. And, you know, the Jose Martinez's coffee tastes better than the, um, you know, whatever blend that comes in a giant can. It doesn't have any sort of provenance associated with it. But I think that some of it is also the sort of intangible of knowing that you're connected to someone and it's part of a community. And that's part of the reason that I go to the farmer's market. It is because the tomatoes taste better, but it's also because I value that community. It's it, I am paying for the tomato, but I'm, I'm paying for more than that. And I feel like that's true with coffee too. And I want to be okay with that. I want to be cautious of romanticizing the farmer for the gain of the buyer or something like that, like using that person as some sort of marketing tool. It's like I want to be able to hold both of those things to say, yeah, we shouldn't romanticize them too much, but also say, no, it's cool. You feel connected to Jose Martinez and you love that person's coffee and you're excited for it next year. And that's really meaningful. I want to talk a little bit more about the future of the coffee farmer. What can you forecast a coffee farm to look like in terms of um, employment opportunities and landscape um, in, say, 20 years? All the indicators are telling us that if we don't change the way that we approach valuing coffee, that in 20 years, more and more coffee will be produced in Brazil and Vietnam in places where it can be, um, it can be harvested very efficiently, largely mechanized uh, harvesting. And um, less and less of that will come from Central America, um, certainly, I think the Americas in general outside of Brazil, East Africa, um, will just get more and more consolidation to places where it's, um, it's a, it, you're able to mechanize it because these small farms are not the most efficient producers of coffee. And when labor is 60-ish percent of the cost of producing coffee, um, everyone's seeing that as and sort of seeing compliance with minimum wage, much less living wage, and wondering how are we going to make this work if we can't mechanize. So I think we either need to revalue coffee uh, pretty dramatically or be okay with less of our coffee coming or more of our coffee coming from fewer places. 
Do you see uh, any other uh, storylines for the future of, of how we will uh, consume coffee? I think the wine analogy is always, people criticize these wine analogies because they're tired, but I'm not tired of them because I still feel like there's utility in, uh, in nuances there. And yeah, imagine if all wine, if we had this idea of commodity wine, that was two buck chuck or something. And and based on that, we indexed all other wine to $2. Like, oh, this is $2 plus $27. You know, that's way too much for me to pay. Oh, this is $2 plus. And I feel like because of the way that coffee is traded as a commodity, we kind of do that with the pricing. When we pay for coffee as, as green coffee buyers, it's often with the reference to whatever the market price of the day is, like we're buying the same thing and we're not, you know? I mean, it's like, it looks, it's all coffee, but, but it's not. I think that that is probably the more, you know, the most sustainable storyline for coffee is that we identify what commodity coffee is and, um, and accept the fact that not all coffee is going to be great and try to make commodity coffee as, you know, efficient as possible, narrow in on what the, um, what the needs are, like for a, an environment, for, from the environmental perspective, from fertilizing to labor to, you know, yeah, what that economic model looks like, and then try to separate everything that's not commodity coffee from that and say, we need to start talking about that differently. Like, of course, we still have to call it coffee, but mm -hmm. this has to, um, this can't just be commodity plus anymore. If, if we value coffee from El Salvador or Costa Rica or, um, you know, Rwanda, then we can't talk about it or, or compare it to coffee from Brazil and Vietnam, unless it's a really special coffee from Brazil and Vietnam, because those happen too, you know? right. no simple answers, but, uh, but for, you know, from the, the major volume perspective. So much of this stuff, and I think you and I talked about it at one point, it's like coffee is not actually, a lot of these things aren't actually getting worse. We just yeah. didn't know about them before. You know, it's like the, the struggles that we're facing, economic development or um, labor scarcity or, you know, young people don't want to farm coffee. It's like, it's a good thing that they have options. It's bad for coffee right now, but you know, in many ways it used to be a lot worse. We just didn't have that visibility into our supply chain. We didn't know who Jose Martinez was or where his farm was. And we didn't know that he had three kids and that none of them wants to take over the farm or whatever the story is. And so now we know, and it makes it seem like we're in this terrible position because we under we see how vulnerable we are, but we've always been that way. We just, we just didn't know it. And I guess I would rather, I would rather know, so. Yeah, the curtain's been pulled back and you really can't shut it again. Yeah, because we couldn't have worked on it before. Like if we hadn't, uh, if we didn't know, then how could we have possibly changed anything? And now it feels like we know what we have to do, but it's also obvious how many things we haven't tried. And so we have so many options. We've got like, okay, let's work on the genetic diversity. Like that's a project for an organization or 20, you know, we've got this, uh, this question about generational transition and, and youth. Okay. Like that's, there's a lot of opportunity there. And, um, and these, these things are the same, but we're talking about 60 different countries. There's just, there's so much opportunity there. Stop it.
I was really nervous to talk to Kim, but she's super sweet, thoughtful, and nice. And it got me thinking. See you guys next time. I love you. Bye-bye.